Hey, are you getting my system sounds? I am. Okay. Hey, good. things are working. Okay. Things that's look a good weird, sign. but they're working. Okay. Good. All right. Well, we're going to, you know what? All the fun stuff that I had planned, uh, I'm just not going to do because no. nothing broke. Everything broke, and I don't even have stuff in here. Okay. So we're, we're okay. using a different system today because sure. StreamYard wasn't working. It, it, failed when it tried going live okay. uh so hi everybody uh i'm steve taylor welcome to another episode of the rocket msp podcast uh, i am your host and today we're joined by ziggy ziggy you are uh i believe the founder of white cloud security yes i am awesome so i i gotta i gotta ask wh what is it what is white cloud security? So yeah. in, in 2011, I joined a company called uh, Core Trace in Austin, mm -hmm. Texas as the VP of engineering. Um, and they were trying to get the product cleaned up and working so they could uh, sell the company. And they eventually, and, they, and, and after I took over, the, uh, they were able to sell it to Lamention Security. And that was a application whitelisting product. And their major competitor at the time was... Uh, Bit9, which then became Carbon Black. And during the, uh, I think it was the summer of 2011, I was talking to the IT security manager for an electrical power system in the Midwest. They supply power to about four or five million people. And he said that their, one of their software vendors had been hacked. And he, and, and, but he said he wasn't concerned because of the application control that they were running from CoreTrace at the time. Um, that he knew that even if the hackers put in a back door, they wouldn't be able to launch any new executables or load any new DLLs. And so that really told me back in 2011 that people who really understood the concept of execution control, you know, valued it and understood how it could help protect them. And when Lamention Security acquired CoreTrace in November 2011, or 12, um, I just chose not to go with them. They offered me a job, but I, I thought that the product could be, you know, the concept of application whitelisting could be changed, its direction and how uh, it's used and make it much easier to use. Uh, and we've, we've done that. We've basically made it, more, uh, made it simple, made it even more secure, and made it easy to scale. And so um, basically what it does, the simplest way of explaining it is imagine that you have... Um, uh, an antivirus guard at the bank, Steve, and you come into the front of the bank and he's going to look through all, all his wanted posters and he's going to go, Steve, you look like this bank robber, right? And he's got a scar on his head like this, but, you know, maybe you've touched it up with makeup and you can't come in. So you step out of the bank, you put on the ski mask, you come back in, you've got on your rocket launcher, <laughs> you've got grenades, you've got a bullet, you've got a, uh, uh, a bomb vest, and the bank guard now, the antivirus bank guard now looks through all your wanted posters and he goes, Steve, none of my wanted posters match your ski mask face. And my behavioral analysis, because I've got this, you know, machine learning and AI here, uh, I'm taught that if you're a bank robber, you're supposed to have a bulletproof vest and you're supposed to have maybe a, a sawed off shotgun or a pistol. But uh, I see that you've got a bomb vest and you've got AK-47, and you've got grenades, and uh, so that doesn't really qualify you. So come on in, right? And that's, antivirus just isn't working because they're trying to look for the needle in the haystack. Uh, it's the old way we used to do TSA, and I'm not saying that TSA is perfect yet, but the old way, you know, you're, you're trying to search through suitcases looking for contraband, running people through metal detectors, and at least now, supposedly, TSA knows who is actually getting on the plane because they're verifying their ID. And so uh, a technology, whether it's an application whitelisting or ours, uh, when you come into the bank, we're going to take your hand and we're going to essentially put it on a scanner. And if your handprint matches a handprint of somebody who's on the trust list, then you're allowed to come into the bank. Otherwise, you're always blocked. Does that explain it? I can't hear you, Steve. You're muted. So uh, what I'm what I'm hearing is whitelisting. You're it's 
it's whitelisting on steroids because it has some additional functionality to it. And the way we do it is not the same as application whitelisting. Um, traditionally, application whitelisting is you've basically got a whole bunch of information on the endpoint. And that endpoint, if let's say, for instance, I have 10,000 endpoints and I have a new app, I have to go figure out and which endpoint to go push that to. And, and so if, if I don't know which endpoint needs that new rule or policy, I have to push it out to all 10,000 endpoints. Instead, our trust listing is more like a client server type approach. And so whether, there are, whether our service is running as a data center appliance or whether it's running as a, a cloud service in something like Oracle OCI or AWS or whether it's running off of our SaaS service, every time a new handprint for an app for a script, an SO file, or a DLL are encountered, it's basically going to go up and send that handprint, and like on Windows, it'll also send a code signing certificate. And then we look at that, and we look it through a trust list. And the trust list is actually an inheritance tree. So if you're, let's say, Chase Bank, and you're going to trust everything in Windows 10, you would trust that at the very top of your inheritance for all of your Windows systems. And, uh, that are running Windows 10, and then it doesn't matter where one of those hosts are. When you get an update for Windows 10 and it's updated here in the tree, everything, uh, every one of those endpoints gets that new trust without having to do any pushes. So it's really, it's really quite different than application whitelisting. This, the concept is exactly the same in terms of how it uses default deny. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. All right. So. You know, it, it sounds like a, a really neat thing. Okay, so um, there are other tools out there. Let's uh, mm -hmm. sure. let's just pick one, one that I like, ThreatLocker. Okay. Sure. So I'm not asking you to like bash ThreatLocker or anything like that. I know that wouldn't be cool, right? But what would you say you are doing uh, differently okay. in a way to kind of disrupt what ThreatLocker has has done to date because okay. I mean, if you think about it they've they've accomplished a great deal of things so so let me besides threat locker let me just give you some others because i think that your your msps and listeners should choose at least one of these technologies if they don't buy us they should buy threat locker or they should use uh, bit nine or they should use app locker or they should use mcafee solid core they should use some form of execution control and so the main difference from between us and ThreatLocker, one of the things we've seen is that it appears that ThreatLocker is using uh, MD5s to identify files. Now our technology, instead of just using a single hash as a fingerprint, we use five different hashes. And in 2014, Edward Snowden uh, released some information on the internet that was uh, basically informed the world that the RSA was taking money from the NSA to weaken their encryption algorithms. And we all know why the NSA wants to do that. It's because, you know, they want to spy on everybody. Uh, but it really got me thinking about, because at that time, everybody was using a SHA-1. Now, an MD5 is much weaker than a SHA-1. But a SHA-1 has actually a weakness that has been revealed since 2014. And as uh, I was concerned about, well, how long would it be before a hacker could basically take a piece, of mal a piece of malware and run it through some kind of a process uh, to where he could make his malware's MD5 or SHA-1 match a known good fingerprint that's in your SHA-1 or MD5 database. And so I started searching the internet back in 2014 and I found a, uh, a web page by Bruce Schneier. He was uh, worked for uh, um, Resilient Technology at the time. He was their CTO. And they, he was, they were later acquired by IBM. But a couple of years earlier, at lunch, they had kind of done the math because I guess they were aware of this particular algorithmic issue. And so they said, hey, what's it going to take? And my interpretation of their math in 2014 was that by 2018 or 2020, uh, the Russian mafia, for instance, could basically take thirty dollars or $40,000 and buy enough computer time on Amazon EC2 or any other kind of system in order to have enough CPU power to run through this algorithm. And so in 2014, that really kind of panicked me because as a, as a owner and a vendor of a, 
a tech of an application control technology that's depending upon a SHA-1 fingerprint, it meant we were going to be out of business in, in uh, let's say, 2018 or 2020, based on, on my math. Well, in February of 2017, Google announced a thing called the shattered attack. And what that shattered attack was, was they said, hey, here's this algorithm. And this is the one that Bruce Schneier and the other guys were talking about. Said, yeah, we can basically take any file that has, that has a SHA-1 and we can make a permutation of that file and make the permutation report to have the same SHA-1 and the same file length. Uh, we at least in, in 2014 had a file size in addition to the hash as a way to reduce the concept or the, the possibility of collisions. But in this particular case, this was a real problem in 2017 in February. Well, the good thing for us is that we had been collecting and using handprint technology since uh, April of 2015. We, uh, actually, 2014 is we collected them all that year. And then in 2015, during the summer when we, went, when we basically went uh, commercial, we were using a handprint technology instead of a single hash. And so when Google announced this in 2017, it was, it was really great for us because we had a technology that was not susceptible to that kind of bypass of your application whitelisting. And our patent for that was actually issued on March 7th of 2017, the very next month by the USPTO. So we were all very happy about that. So that's one really important thing that's different. A next thing that's different between Threat Locker and White Cloud Security, because we are a client server type model, when a new file is is basically found, we go up immediately to say, hey, is, the, is this basically handprint? You know, is it already known bad? Is it on the trust list for this particular inheritance tree? And so if, if it comes back and says, no, it's been blocked and it blocks the file, and one of our technicians, you know, on our TAME team is able to go, hey, I'm going to add trust for that. You don't have to wait 5, 10, 30, 60 seconds for the system to push it down because all the person has to do is say, okay, it's trusted, and then the person runs it again. It could be one or two seconds after the trust is added, and, and that trust automatically allows the app to run, so there's no time period. And the same goes for a, a denier or block policy. You know, when somebody adds a new, uh, uh, a new block policy, a global block, a good example was that with the Kaseya attack that happened recently. Um, I was actually on vacation for my wife's birthday at a resort in Texas, and I was inspired to go check my email. And, uh, and one of our MSPs out in California had sent me an email, and he said, hey, I just, you know, I'm, I'm a uh, Kaseya RMM user, and I just found out they've been hacked. Is there a way to add a policy against this? And so I just did a quick Google, went to Reddit. I found out some of the IOCs, and, ver and within less than a minute, I was able to find that one of our actual users in our system actually had been affected by that because he was running in monitor mode, he wasn't protected, he knew better. And, and I was able to apply global block policy that protected everybody. And one of the things that I, I later saw in a, a release from Threat Locker is they indicated that if you were in secure mode, uh, you were already protected. And if you weren't, they were there to help you. So I don't really, because I, I don't, try to steal or spy on other people's technology. Uh, I've never taken a demo from them. I've, I've uh, one time told their, one of their sales guys, I'm a competitor. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair for you to give me a demo of your product. Uh, I've seen some of their videos on YouTube, which is public, and so that's fair game. But um, to me, I'm not sure whether they have a global block policy that can be implemented the way we do. Uh, so that's, that's another difference. So you've got this handprint technology that's much more secure. We actually won a, uh, a U.S. military contract to protect a weapons control system. And one of the reasons that they chose us over the other two major competitors uh, that are long-time established application whitelisting vendors was our handprint technology. And the other reason was in the Linux, we we're actually compiled into the kernel. So the hacker can't just get rid of our code. So those are some minor differences and uh, another another thing that's actually significant in the difference between us and threat locker and these differences apply to us and every other application whitelisting vendor out there another one is that if you are using like a threat locker or carbon black bit 9 or mcafee or app locker 
if you're running, let's say, for instance, Enable uh, from SolarWinds, and there's, their agent has to fire off batch scripts. Um, Kaseya, I think, fires off batch scripts. Uh, ConnectWise fires off B, v, uh, VBS scripts. And, and so just, and Datto does the same thing. So all of these RMM tools typically will have some kind of an agent which is firing off either a batch file or a dot .command or a script. And that script is changing every time it fires off in some cases, which means that you can't use, for instance, AppLocker uh, or ThreatLocker to run with basically that RMM agent unless you either wildcard trust the file name or you trust the directory folder that it's executing out of. And we think that's a very dangerous and insecure way to operate any kind of business. Today, if, if, some, if somebody says, well, you know, I'm going to install this computer here, and I said, well, you just don't have a password on that one computer in your network, everybody would laugh at you. But these application whitelisting vendors go out and they open and trust a directory um, and say, hey, anything that runs in this directory is allowed to run. Once I'm a hacker and I find out that you're running Kaseya or Datto or ConnectWise, uh, I know exactly what you have to do in your application whitelisting system to get it to run except for white cloud security. And what we do there is we have what we call ch uh, ch uh, trusted children. And so in that particular case, we're able to trust that agent, and we say that agent is allowed to run processes down to one layer deep, two layers, three layers, whatever amount of layers that you need, you can specify in the policy. And so what that means is now anything that's trying to run that's being auto-generated on the fly dynamically by that particular software. And, and this works the same for um, uh, Creative Cloud, Adobe's another one. Adobe finds, con continually finds ways to add new vulnerabilities to Windows and other systems. But essentially what it does they is do it'll... do not. <laughs> yeah. Adobe's a wonderful company that does no wrong. Uh, well, I like the Adobe products. I've used many of their products over the years. I just get frustrated with uh, them continuing to use tools because, you know, this, this really could turn into a discussion about, well, what could application software vendors do to make themselves more secure. And one of them, somebody like Adobe, was instead of distributing all this JavaScript code underneath Creative Cloud, you can actually bundle it into an executable that you can then sign. Okay, mm -hmm. So you could just release an executable that is properly signed and, and has all that JavaScript has been converted into you know, the EXE, which is the much more secure way of doing it. But we have a lot of people that are now say, "Oh, wow, that's so cool! I can run Node, Node as an app," and uh, it's not the only it's not the only app doing it wrong that way. Uh, see, this is where I think Go language. If you're going to create a Go program, you can create a for Windows a Go EXE, and then you can sign that, and then it's very clear. Now, what's even better though, instead of code signing certificates, is use our handprint technology. So we give vendors free accounts for being able to add signatures, and so then. Uh, one of the things that might be different between us and uh, ThreatLocker is the way that our trust listing system works. So if I go in and say, hey, I'm going to trust Adobe, right? And all I have to do is click trust for Adobe one time. And now every time the Adobe team updates and adds new handprints to the trust list, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go off and say, oh, it's a new code signing certificate or that. The, when my endpoint tries to run that new Adobe executable and it, and it basically says, hey, this is an unknown handprint. It goes up to the service and then the service says, hey, where's this handprint from? And it'd say, oh, this is part of Adobe. And it would then say, oh, Adobe's already added that to their trust list. And so my system gets that cache down in the driver um, so that it knows, hey, this is something that's allowed to run for you. And so that's another thing that's different is, is we came up with what's called secure crowdsourcing. It's a way to be able to, uh, to allow vendors outside of white cloud security to, to establish an account and say, hey, here is a profile. And anybody who trusts, trusts our profile will be able to automatically get updates without having to do anything. You don't have to add a policy. You don't have to create a new template. You don't have to do anything. Uh, so we're, we're going to be rolling that out with our Kubernetes protection this uh, next quarter. And in that case, if I have a container in Docker or in Kubernetes that I'm going to deploy the Docker container on Kubernetes, 
the user basically all he has to do in white cloud security is say for this container or this subgroup of containers or this inheritance tree of of systems that are running on containers i trust that one container vendor one time and every time they update their their software for the container all of my systems have that and when they say hey we have a a problem we know that this particular image or this this particular file in this container is no longer trustworthy and they remove trust for it that trust disappears from the entire inheritance tree and i think that that's probably extremely different and extremely valuable compared to what threat locker app locker and uh, bit9 can do does that make sense uh i would be lying if i said yes all of that made perfect sense um because it didn't okay uh, but that doesn't mean that just means i'm not doing as much tech as i used to be okay sure um sure. all right so you, you know what i find i tell people it's kind of like riding a bike or swimming mm -hmm. okay so you know uh you know how to swim i i can doggy paddle Okay, so so if I if I threw you in a big lake, you would be able to doggy paddle for some period of time, right? And but the first time before you and I learned how to swim, that that pool looked pretty scary, right? And oh, yeah. uh, and so what we try to do is we we've tried to design white cloud security to bring the bottom of the pool up, so that you can kind of stand up in the pool first, right? And you can learn to swim in the shallow end, and then you can go out. I'm, I'm, I've got uh, advanced open water uh, scuba paddy certification. So I was afraid of being out over 500 feet of uh, ocean depth, you know, until I got to a, a certain point. And then a, a nitrogen narcosis kicks in and that really helps you to have that euphoria. And then you don't worry about, you know, drowning. But, uh, but, Are, but is, that of, a, <laughs> is that a, because the, the end is coming and you're. <laughs> what happens is the nitrogen narcosis is kind of like, I guess, being stoned or, you know, that mellow period of somebody's drunk, right? And they're really happy about everything in life, right? And, it, and I first read about it before I experienced in uh, one of uh, uh, Zelazny's uh, science fictions about a guy who has uh, saved another guy's life who had gone off into nit nitrogen narcosis. But what it does is it affects your brain in a way that you just feel euphoric. I remember uh, on that first open water dive down around 130 feet, I'm following the coral around and, uh, and I'm going deeper, not realizing I'm going deeper. And the instructor's above me. He, he's from, this is in Fiji. And he's going, he's like, come in here. And he's like, check your, he's like, check your gauge, you know. And I look at my gauge and I have like 500 pounds of, uh, of pressure. And I'm down like 130 feet. And I'm going like, I'm okay. <laughs> so, you know, and, and to be honest, that's how a lot of people today think about cybersecurity. They say, I've got the best antivirus. I, I just went to PC Magazine and I saw that Symantec or I saw that McAfee or I oh, saw yeah, that Bitdefender. Yeah, or I, or I, yeah. Good choice. Right. So I saw that this was the newest, best one. But the problem is that's an arms race. Uh, in other words, it depends upon how many of uh, cybersecurity engineers you have doing research. Mm -hmm. so, so we see on a regular basis, uh, one of the things that I will show here uh, during the demo is I'll go show a couple of cases of some malware and we'll, we'll see that there's a major vendor that still doesn't know about one piece of malware I think that I had seen as I was kind of reviewing this. And so what will happen is you'll have a piece of malware that this one vendor, let's say 60 other vendors all know that this is malware and one of the major vendors still doesn't know it. And if you're using them as your antivirus and it runs on your system, you're going to get hacked. And, and that's that's why this whole concept of blacklisting doesn't work. It didn't work at the TSA. It's, it's not a, the right way of doing things. Obviously, you know, we, we, we don't want, I go back to the Eddie Murphy movie, you know, um, I don't know if it was 48 hours or maybe it was, oh, it was Beverly Hills Cop. And he gets his, into the country club by pretending to be somebody who has a relationship with the guy he's trying to talk to. And, and, the, and the maitre d' says, okay, you tell him, right? And so we don't want to be socially engineered into doing the wrong things. And, and uh, antivirus blacklisting just isn't the right way to protect us. These are, they are important layers, but, but they can't be your only layer of defense. It, it would be like saying that I could have phishing, uh, you know, phishing attack protection for email, 
but not have any anti-malware protection at all in my system. I think that makes sense when you really think about it. But people think that any virus is it because the industry has been lying to them uh, for 20 odd years. And it was back in 2015, so here I'm prattling on. I think it was in May, uh, May 4th or 5th of 2015 that Brian Dye, who was an executive vice president at Symantec, publicly said to the Wall Street Journal, any virus is dead. We only catch about 45% of new viruses. And that has not changed. All, all that happened in 2015 was that he admitted it publicly. He, I don't think he's working for them anymore. Um, and, I, and I applaud him for being forthright and honest. And that's what we should be, the entire cybersecurity industry. And SolarWinds and Kaseya have been forthright and direct about what's going on. Um, there's another vendor that I'm not too sure how forthright they're being about a potential a vulnerability they might have. Uh, I don't want to talk about that in particular because I don't want to give somebody a black eye. We're blocking uh, an antivirus product right now because we've seen on Joe Sandbox that it's um, flagged as being ransomware. And it could be yet, you know, the third um, supply chain attack this year uh, against a major, you know, MSP slash cybersecurity tool. And it's really, it's really serious. Um, all right. So I, I have so many questions right now. Go so ahead. you say you don't want to give them a black eye, but at, at what cost? Uh, so, I mean, so, you know, so at, he, at the cost of not informing us that there could be a potential issue opening us up to yet another one of these issue, uh, big, big breaches. So they've been informed and ThreatLocker has found out from some of their customers that we had raised this alarm and they, and they actually sent out an email explaining to their, you know, prospects and their uh, customers saying, hey, this other cybersecurity company, which was White Cloud, uh, they didn't say White Cloud, has basically said that this particular antivirus, WebRoot, has showing up as having basically a poison ivy virus inside of its wrsa.exe file. And, uh, and so I found, I found this. Now, this has probably been around for some time since March. I stumbled on it because uh, on, on late Saturday night, I was doing some maintenance and I was just looking through and I, I just had this feeling about a file. I went and looked at it and I went and looked at it on Joe Sandbox and I says, whoa, what's going on there? And so I basically sent uh, WebRoot, you know, a, 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 you know, through their website, hey, here's something that, you know, it's really you need to address because it's saying that this is poison ivy, you know, inside of your agent. You know, we, we just, and I told him, I, I was very clear in my email to them, I don't want to block software that's good. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to give somebody a black eye, but you're right. You know, you, uh, I don't want people to be using a product. People should be saying, why are you doing this? And so they, their, their response was very terse and says, oh, that's our file. Okay, now it was code signed. You know, we don't know whether, whether uh, you know, we also know from SolarWinds that hackers have figured out simple ways to be able to inject them, their code into the supply chain compile build process. We saw that Avira in September 2017 got hacked, uh, not Avira itself, but uh, CCleaner, which was owned by Avira at that time. It wasn't Avira's fault because they just acquired them. So... And, and Bit9 itself, which is Carbon Black, had been hacked back in February of 2013 because hackers stole their code signing certificate. So it's not unreasonable to, to say, hey, I have a file that's code signed, and that file, that, that code signing certificate has been compromised in some fashion. And so my response to them was they said, yeah, it's our file. And a lot of antivirus vendors, in fact, they actually said, Joe Sandbox, we use it? We've confirmed that, that Joe Sandbox says what you say it does. So WebRoot, in their message back to me, said, we confirm what you say. It's, it's just not bad behavior. It's, we're, just not, we're just not malicious, is what they said. Uh, and they said other antivirus vendors also say that we're malware, and we're not. Okay? And so essentially then I responded with five questions. Uh, and so I will, I'll end up releasing that, and you can post that as a link to the bottom of this. I could actually bring it up, but I don't know that it's productive to go into that kind of a thing. Maybe a different session to talk about this or Kaseya attack 
in particular, because I have some interesting things to, to maybe talk about there. But in this particular case, one of the major questions was, so if Joe Sandbox is saying that you are behaving in this particular fashion that looks like poison ivy virus, why would any of your customers, if, if that's really your behavior, and that's something that's really in your code, why would any of us want to have web root agent running on our system that has a back door in it? I mean, the purpose of, of the antivirus is to block malware, not to give somebody a back door into your system. That's what RMM tools like Kaseya and uh, Datto and Atera, uh, and Atera and ConnectWise are for. That's not the job for web root. So if web root is showing up by uh, on Joe Sandbox as being poison ivy. Now, so there were, so ThreatLocker heard about this and ThreatLocker, they wanted to confirm it. So they actually went and they looked at Joe Sandbox for this version of this uh, WRSA.exe from WebRoot. And they sent out an email saying, we confirm what the other cybersecurity company said. Yeah, it is showing up as being malicious. But we have talked to WebRoot and WebRoot says, hey, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> you may go about your business. And they is, said, is that why uh, a few days ago, Threat Locker announced a false flag? Yeah, probably so. Probably so. Now, the question is, I've sent from the very beginning in, in alerts to our customers said, we can't confirm whether this is malware. All we can do is tell you what we've seen and our concerns about it. And then our and, and then we basically provided to our customers what our initial uh, feedback to web root was and what their response was, and then my five questions to them, which they've never answered, okay? And, That's you know, good. it's not good. And, and then I saw another file, which was another version of, of WRSA.exe, which is being shown by, uh, it's a different instance. So our handprint technology can tell two files apart, even if a single bit has changed. And so there's two different files out there. One of them is showing Poison Ivy, uh, as, as being a poison ivy Trojan, um, remote access Trojan at, by Joe Sandbox, and the other one is being shown by Falcon Sandbox as being ransomware. So, so it's really kind of strange. The other thing that bothers me uh, about all this, we use VirusTotal and we're integrated in with VirusTotal so we can help our, our MSPs and our IT departments be able to very quickly make some judgment calls about what you need to be able to trust. You can't just look at a file and say, oh, I should trust this. We, we should have learned from uh, CCleaner and from SolarWinds, just because a file signed doesn't mean it's infected. Sometimes you do want to look and see what's going on um, you know, in, the other, in the antivirus industry to see, hey, if this file's been analyzed, has anybody identified something suspicious about it? And so for me, one of the things that's the, the worst about this, uh, this web root thing is the all the number of indicators that are evasive. So when you go into Joe Sandbox, what's really cool is Joe Sandbox has the, the MITRE attack vector. And so we'll go through and we'll do some demonstrations. We'll go find some of these things and, uh, and, and show how you can, from our dashboard, very quickly go to Falcon Sandbox and to Joe Sandbox with a click of a button or virus total. And we actually show the virus total count, hit counts on our system uh, for files that uh, are basically not clean. And that was one of the things that was uh, bad about uh, Virus Total, which is a Google company. Um, we've, been, we've been partners with them for a long time. But originally what they would do is when they would analyze a file with their 60 plus antivirus engines, they'd say it was clean. Now they don't say that anymore. They, they now realize that just because an AV engine doesn't detect something doesn't mean the file's clean. It means it detected nothing. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if I'm a if I'm a TSA agent and everybody goes through the scanner and I don't find any weapons, it doesn't mean that there's no threat. It just means that I didn't detect a threat. And that's how people have to kind of change their mindset. And this is why products like Threat Locker and White Cloud Security are important. If you don't use us, you should use Threat Locker. We we've, uh, ran into a guy from South Dakota who faithfully used AppLocker for like six years. And I applauded that. It's very hard. It was taking him he got to a point where it's taking him 15 to 30 minutes to add trust because he had 48 clients and he had to go with AppLocker and add the trust into every one of their uh, groups. And then with us, he could add it into his inheritance tree with like two or three clicks in less than three seconds. 
And so that's a big difference in, in ease of use and, and quickness. Um, so do you want to talk about Kaseya, the Kaseya attack or anything like that? Or you want to see a demo? What, what's it of most interest to you at this point? Um, I have questions. Go ahead. So uh, the first question is, I, I'm genuinely curious what the five questions you sent back to them were. Okay, let me go over and let me uh, pull up. Let me pull up the Google Groups that we have. And I've got that in here, so I should be able to pull it and I can drag it over to the other screen. Give me just one second. All right. My goal here was not to bash WebRoot or anything else, no, but I, I do, I do really respect um, your point about you know people need to know, and uh, let's see here. And uh, while you're while you're looking those up, um, is your product zero knowledge? Uh, what do you mean by that? So I'll take the Sarah Palin fifth amendment <laughs> instead of answering a question that you don't know the answer to, right? Like you do know the answer to and, and look like an idiot. I prefer to ask. So when you say zero knowledge, what does that mean to you? Uh, the definition that I typically use is does your product, uh, look at the I know you're looking at bits and bytes, but you know, is it reading my, my 2020 taxes? Oh no, no, no. In fact, that's one of the great things about the way we've written our product. We don't move any files off of the endpoint at all. Okay. So we don't have any, we don't have any tool in there that would allow us to delete your files. We don't have any tool to let us copy them. We don't have any tool that would allow us to upload your files, even to virus total. And the reason we don't is because then there's can be HIPAA concerns because if I'm a, if I'm a hacker, right. And I want to, to steal your data, right. Then what I do is I somehow attach, I somehow find a way to attach data to a unknown executable. Right. And then when it gets blocked, the system would upload that to let's say virus total for analysis. And now the data file that got attached to it is uploaded. So we avoid that kind of behavior uh, for very good reasons. S Steve Snap and I have been in, he's our CTO. We've been in the cybersecurity world. He's been in it, in this business since, um, oh, since the days of Moses. Uh, he, I would say, probably got into it around the 92, 93 timeframe. And I joined a company called uh, Wheel Group as the director and became the director of software development back in 1996. And so having worked in uh, network intrusion detection, uh, host-based intrusion detection, uh, automated remediation, and then application whitelisting, uh, that all those four different areas of cybersecurity has given us an understanding of the different kinds of things to be aware of and the different kinds of threat vectors. And, and we also recognize that there's threat vectors nobody has found yet. And, and we just, we protect one very important layer. So you should be able to see this here on my screen right now. I don't know if it's big enough to read, um, but I can read it off. I've actually got it on my screen. And uh, so this, this could be made public, but essentially I'm just saying is if it's being identified as a malicious by Joe Sandbox and other AV vendors, why haven't you gotten them to whitelist your file as safe? You know, so, and this file had, had been around since March of, of, uh, March 18th of 2021 been flagged this way. And so that was really kind of a serious faux pas for me. And, and the, uh, according to the post that came back from ThreatLocker, ThreatLocker had communicated with WebRoot and WebRoot claims that Joe Sandbox is going to whitelist it. If Joe Sandbox whitelists it, then I'm going to come back with some more questions to both of those vendors because I'll want to know about this. So the next thing if it's actually exhibiting the behavior shown on Joe Sandbox and Falcon Sandbox, then how can any of our or your customers uh, trust RSA to not be actually uh, uh, the way that these security indicators claim it to be 
behaving. In other words, what's going on with your software? You know, does it have a backdoor, right? And why, why is it being shown that way? And, and this is why this wasn't published publicly, you know, as a, um, a little boy, you know, and, and the who cried wolf. Because, you know, we, we want to make sure that we give vendors a chance to respond to things like this. And so number th three question down here, I go down too far, no. is uh, has Webroot intentionally added these behaviors to WRSA.exe? So I want to know, hey, if you've added a backdoor, right, that's now showing up as po poison ivy, you know, remote access Trojan, you should tell people, right? That's important for us to know. You know, and then is there some valid reason for them to use evasion tactics? So, in other words, the, one of the things that's showing up here is it's showing up as a virtual, a virtualization and sandbox evasion techniques, and it's also showing up obfuscation and access token manipulation. So, these are all things that really just cry out that there's there's some kind of malware, malicious behavior going on here. So, I don't know. Uh, I I don't want to make claims about what is actually going on with Webroot, but if I saw this with any vendor, my, my concern would be, number one, that somehow the vendor has been hacked and somebody's injected malware and maybe signed it with, you know, a stolen or compromised cert, or I would be concerned that maybe somebody inside the organization has put a back door into the software as an insider to help somebody else or to help themselves. And then the last question I asked was, uh, how can any of your customers know that this hasn't been the result of a supply chain attack like the solar wind sunburst. And, uh, and of course, then uh, they didn't respond to that. I sent another response here. It says, we don't want to block any product because of false positives mistakenly generated by antivirus vendors. Uh, and then I said, several of the indicators being flagged are too serious to ignore with just an out of hand. These are not the droids you're looking for. And then I came back and I said, Falcon Sandbox uh, has, and, and I actually corrected this because I spelled now wrong, has now flagged this uh, instance of WSRA as, as um, malicious. And so if you go and use, go to that particular link, and I guess I could probably go there now. I could go, oh, and that's an image there, so it's not going to show up of text. But essentially, this is a very serious thing, and when we look at, in fact, I've actually got probably some of the links that we could probably jump right to if somebody's interested in seeing them. Let's see if this one has uh, the, the Falcon Sonbex. We'll see whether it's been whitelisted since then. And that's important. Um, we're not trying to get a bounty. We're not trying to beat anybody up. So here we can see that this is malicious, and we can it's flagged as malicious by Falcon Sandbox. And basically, they're saying, hey, this is ransomware. Okay. And uh, this was just a reanalysis that I started on this just the other day. I think we can see uh, it's got a threat score of 100 to 100. And I just want to make sure you know we're seeing the screen that says conversations. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me move that over here. There we go. Thank you very much. Because I was looking at my screen and I used the, one of the links there. So this is the Falcon Sandbox analysis of the second file. And Falcon Sandbox is saying, hey, this is basically being detected as ransomware. And you can go down and you can see all the different indicators on here. Um, we can also go back here to, because I, I do have the links in here, part of this whole group, this announcement we made to our clients, our customers. I think, let me shrink it back down. I probably have to go back to the original link. There we go. Uh, let's go look at the Joe Sandbox uh, link on this. This is the, this is the thing that we're, disturbing at first, and we'll see whether Joe Sandbox has listed this file now or not. Um, and that, maybe they did, but I'm kind of surprised because it looks like they just removed it and not whitelisted it. Uh, let's see what Falcon Sandbox is still claiming on this particular file. Because before, that one showed four poison ivies. So I wanna, I'm going to contact Joe Sandbox and say, well, what did you do? And why did you do that? Because there, there has to be a reason why something's... And this one here says that this is ransomware. It says it's ambiguous, and it has a lot of indicators. Now, let's go look at, let's go look at what I had actually documented before Joe Sandbox had removed this. These are some of the indicators that are showing up in VirusTotal. 
And so I included them there so they're documented. So here was the main thing that I was showing our customer base. These are the, these are the factors that really make me suspicious of this particular file. We see that the, the number of hits or indicators for defense evasion and discovery, for instance, of security software. And here, this is what, before Joe Sandbox deleted this, this was what was being shown on there. And this was basically the MITRE attack vector. And here is the threat classification indicator. This is why it woke me up. This is why I told all of our clients, you don't want to run this. We need to figure out what's going on. Because I have this, I love the way Joe Sandbox does this. They basically take this MITRE uh, attack vector, provides a really clear way of being able to see what's going on with a particular file that I've analyzed. And they take these indicators and they throw them up against these different uh, attack vectors. I think there's 10 of them there. And it's just a really interesting, easy way to see. And so when you see the Kaseya ransomware, you're going to see that the Kaseya ransomware is pointed up here. I think it's also evasive and it might have some spyware associated with it as well. But, you know, it's just, uh, so I will, I will follow up on this. And, and once again, I told our clients from the very beginning, this doesn't mean it is malware. It's just this is what we've seen and we're very concerned about. And, uh, and our MSPs, you know, who use WebRoot, they've been very concerned about it as well. And several of them have sent tickets to WebRoot. And so I think that's why WebRoot finally responded. But I'm not, I'm not convinced. So what I will do is I will take a version of this file and I'll re-upload it to Joe Sandbox and reanalyze it. Because uh, Joe Sandbox shouldn't have just deleted it. They should have, uh, they should have said, hey, uh, they should have whitelisted it. Maybe they don't have a way to easily do that. Let's see if we can let's see if we can go back to it one more time. Do you have a, a question while I'm doing this here? Uh, not a question as much as a request. If sure. I could get you to turn off your camera. Oh, sure. That way we can see, because it doesn't let me change the, the view like I can in StreamYard. Okay. So it'd be awesome if we could just see your Hold screen, on. full screen. Let me, let me go back over here. I have to go to... That's not you. And for those of you that are that are wondering, I, I tried uh, while he's doing that, I, I tried getting the stream going on StreamYard like I normally do. Um, I don't know what I, I think I must have screwed something up on YouTube while I was doing some house cleaning on it earlier this week. It could not start the stream and I couldn't figure out how to fix the stream because I was in panic mode. So we bounced over to Riverside.fm, but... It doesn't give me as much like control. There we go. I'm off. Awesome. So, is that better? And, yes. and nobody needs to see the side of my face anyway. Right. All right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure this is interesting. One of the things is that it's it's a good exercise for kind of walking through. It keeps people on their toes. It helps people because we we can't become complacent and just assume because something's signed. You know, it's the whole thing about, you know, if you see something, say something. If you see somebody doing something, you know, evil or harmful, you, you, need, you need to, if you can't interdict, you should, you know, get somebody who can interdict to help. And, and that's really the whole point here. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to basically continue to bang on uh, web. No, no, you, look, here, here's the, the simple fact is that, um, we we just kind of a you know announced if you will to a lot of people that aren't using one of these whitelisting applications like yours or threat locker that webroot is showing signs of being malicious and if if that's the case MSPs need to know because whether it is or isn't they need to be able to make an informed decision i mean if i'm being honest I don't think I know a single MSP that's using WebRoot because everyone that I know hates it. So, <laughs> and, and I'm okay with that. So I, I do know people who are using it and I found them and, and of course they, we, they started seeing it getting blocked. Uh, what I'm trying to do right now, I just want to go over here and try to put that hash into the search and mm. see if they will show it at all. Um, you know, whitelisting it, um, 
and the real key is what I'll do is I'll do a follow up because I'll go and I'll I'll upload the file again to uh, either I or somebody has this file and we'll we'll basically re-upload it to um, Joe Sandbox and see whether it's even allowed to you know whether they've put some kind of a block on it because the whole point is you gotta you gotta know what's going on let's say the NSA created you know an app and they renamed it something else and they stole the code signing certificate. You know, we would all want to know, you know, we want to be able to analyze that file and see the results of it. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't want to censor. We don't want to censor cybersecurity. Things. You know, there's embarrassing things that happen. I've been embarrassed in my life. I've made mistakes in my life. And we can't just uh, censor what we don't want people to hear or see. Um, censorship is always, is always bad. Uh, and, and, you know, I had a longtime friend that when I was in school with, he, he basically kind of made a public announcement about something and he said, and if you don't like what I'm doing, then tell, tell me, you know, I want you to respond so we'll know who you are, right? <laughs> and I think that's kind of a valid way. You know, if somebody acts hateful towards other people, you, you know who they are, right? But, you know, we should, we should not try to, we should, we're all adults and we should be able to ignore, you know, stuff. So if I say that Webroot is bad, right? Well, that's my opinion. You know, it's actually not my opinion. I'm just saying if that was the case. Um, right. But and, uh, and again, it's okay, you know, it's okay to be wrong, mm -hmm. but I would rather notify people and say, hey, I think there might be a problem here. Yes. Instead of, uh, you know, sweeping it under the rug and, and going with, well, they haven't responded to me yet. So I guess I don't really th know that this is whatever, you know? So, right. um, all right. So I want to go back because I don't know that I got a proper answer to my one question about zero knowledge. Okay. Yes, you didn't. Cause I, I'm not sure we, I'm not, not sure. Yo, the zero knowledge was that whether I am going to have any information, uh, any knowledge of what's in your system, the contents of it. Yeah. So, and, and like, I guess the official question is, can you see into our tenant and our clients tenants? No, all we do, all we can see is that handprint. So we, we don't actually get a copy of the executables. We don't get a copy of the script. We have actually a vault feature. So I can go in for a particular subgroup. I can say, okay, for this particular machine here, uh, for the subgroup, I can say, hey, for this particular machine, uh, I can go down in here, and I'm in the wrong place. Uh, so either for, in fact, let me go to one of my subgroups that I have. Um, I'm trying to look for sparks. And then while you're looking that up, um, we do also have another question. Sure. Uh, do you have tamper protection? Uh, we, we don't. We don't, and, and there's a reason for that. We actually are going to partner up with Beyond Trust. We've had uh, discussions with them about being a reseller for them. And uh, one of the things is because White Cloud Security, uh, nobody can remove or mess with the driver unless they have administrative privileges. And our, our CTO has, uh, at, in past experiences with application whitelisting, found that it, could be, that it was a nightmare putting in tamper protection because people always find a way to get around it in many cases anyway. And to use a vendor such as Beyond Trust uh, makes things a lot more convenient for, because then you can apply it to lots of other things other than just us. And it makes sense to have a more general purpose uh, tamper prevention than just us. Um, so let me see here. Part of my problem is I can't see anymore. And I don't have my glasses on. I guess I should put my glasses back on now that I'm not on TV anymore. So if I go into the subgroup, one of the features we have is we have what we call a app vault where I can go in and enable that vault. And what it'll do now is every time a unknown script or, or a small DLL tries to run, We'll capture a copy of it, but that stays in the vault on that endpoint. And that way, the cybersecurity administrator 
or the IT administrator can look at the files in that vault because a lot of times when malware fires off a script, they will basically then delete that script right away because they don't want people to see what it did. And so by having the vault feature, we're able to keep and track. You know, it's like having a fingerprint that the bad guy can't erase. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so, but other than the vault, we don't do anything on your file system. We don't do anything with your data. We don't look at your data. We don't look at any of your config files. We don't look at any of your registry settings. Uh, we are completely, um, what we are is we're a file filter driver that's basically looking at the uh, execution of executables, the loading of DLLs, and the loading of scripts by scripting engines. Um, and we actually have a feature where you can go in and you can take any policy, so you can take any app and say, I'm going to turn on a layer where I'm going to block any, any file that it tries to read unless that file matches a known trusted handprint. So you could say, basically, I've got Python running, and it's got, let's say, a config file or PHP, and I've got a config file that I want to make sure that that config file is always the same. And so if you turn on that functionality, every time that config file loads, it has to match the handprint of a known trusted file. And so what that does can help you lock down you know, the, the use of software in your system for interpreters so that they're not trying to run with a configuration that's not something you want to be able to approve, like something that's changing the path or changing the functionality of the software. Um, but yeah, we never look at your data and we don't export it from the system. There's no way to get it from the system either. No. That's, what, that's what RMMs are for, see? And if we put in a back door, then we'd be just as bad as, as somebody who's an antivirus vendor that now has Poison Ivy as a remote access Trojan. Got it. Okay, so... Um, trying to figure out how to phrase this question. So is it that you, you can't or you won't? It's really that my, my CTO won't because of experience and uh, his experiences. Now, we know eventually, probably with the DOD, they'll probably want for Windows some form of anti-tamper protection from us instead of from a third-party vendor. But typically what we found is that you know, these federal contractors in the government are already using people like Beyond Trust to do exactly what we've had. A, we've had a, a, one of our MSPs in Australia. He, he, wanted, he wanted us to implement it ourselves. And, and our CTO has a philosophical, you know, obstacle to that. And, uh, and so I understand, I understand the argument on both sides, but I think that using a product which does privilege elevation control service control, installation control. I mean, with us, you get installation control because we're not going to allow something to run. But it looks like recently, in the past, many years ago, we had a way of, that if you just distrusted the MSI file, uh, it wouldn't allow it to uninstall. Uh, but Windows has changed things. They keep changing how things happen. And, so, and this is one of the problems with whatever kind of tamper prevention, even if you've got... so. So you can go as far as making it almost impossible, I think, to even uninstall in safe mode, but I bet you most tamper prevention-based software I can remove if I go into safe mode, or if I have my trusty Linux USB, I can boot into that, that Windows system as Linux, and I can go then remove it from the registry or something else via Linux. So you know, there's, there's a question of what are you trying to actually accomplish? And so we're always very solution-oriented. We want to know what is the goal of what you're trying to accomplish. If, if you're just trying to keep dumb users from uninstalling or, or, uh, or manipulating your cybersecurity software, regardless of us or somebody else, don't allow them to be admins. If, if, you, if the, you have to give them admin privileges, well, then you install something like Beyond Trust or something because it's not just us you need to worry about. That would just be a solution for us and nothing else. And so it makes more sense to have... Does that make more sense? So, yeah, absolutely. I just, okay. you know, wanted to... It's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked. Now, uh, there's another question that came in. What's wrong with your SSL? So I, I see you've got HTTPS, but if you look, it says not secure. Yeah, that is... I'm not sure what's going on there. So that is interesting. Normally, that's not a problem. So let's... If you click on the not secure, it usually shows you what isn't yeah. secure. Yeah, that's, what it's, that's what's going on there. So, so basically, this is, this is going through Cloudflare. Uh, 
So there might be something going on here with cloud uh, with Cloudflare. Um, it could be that, or it could be that your that's probably that's probably your what's website. Going. Your website could simply be delivering. You know, maybe those little icons were not set up with HTTPS. Oh, you're right. It was probably an image or something like that. There was probably some other component that was showing up. So we will run that down and figure out what was causing that. Because that was actually, you're right, that was not our web page. It was some other component that's being loaded. And, and typically, we don't load anything from the global space. We load all the components directly from our own website. But there must be something else that we just didn't catch there. So that's something we're going to have to go back and look at and see what's, um, what's going on there. Okay. Good right. question. And, and we appreciate stuff like that. I'm going to make a note for that to go into, um, into our basically uh, bug list. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rapid fire some questions off sure, with you. Sure, sure. So let's try and keep the answers short and simple. Okay. Um, how long have you guys been in business? We've been in business. Uh, we first had a commercial deployment in June of 2015. We spent a year before that uh, in starting in April of 2014. We did open public trials of our driver at that point in time because we wanted to get a wide variety of computers using it to, to make sure we didn't have any problems. Um, and something that's Ancillary to that is we do a driver update about once a year. It's very, very stable, only when we have to add new features. And you mentioned HIPAA earlier, and that being a reason why you didn't do some things. Do you meet any other compliance regulations like SOC 2, ISO 27001? You know, it's, it's really interesting because no PCI certification, no SOC certification, no HIPAA certification actually makes you secure. Um, and we've looked at doing SOC compliance. In fact, we looked at doing it before it was SOC, when it was the predecessor to that. Um, our kind of tools are what make people available for FedRAMP. We had a partner a few years ago that took White Cloud Security and they built a product that would make people FedRAMP compliant, which is now CMMC. And, uh, and so I think they're still on the drawing board. They had a prototype out and there were some internal problems. But essentially... We fill the gaps that people need filled in the, that uh, 800 NIST standards of 171, and I think the other one is 83. I always get the numbers mixed. Oh, no, 53. 53 and 171. So I, I understand, and I'm sure many people in the MSP computer, uh, computer community understand that um, you, you having a certification, a piece of paper that says you meet this compliance... Uh, it does not make you secure, but it does show us that you take security seriously. So, so one of the things that, because we, Snap and I had experience with uh, doing common criteria back mm -hmm. in the 2011, 2012 timeframe for the federal government and for FIPS. And what ends up happening with a lot of these standards, as soon as you modify your product, it's no longer compliant. And then you have to go through like another SOC audit or another CMCC audit or whatever you have to do. And, and it really is, it's, uh, you can, you can, somebody can say, yeah, they did it. And, and I've seen cases uh, where somebody has done it and then you find out that they've got a SOC letter. So we protect a company that has a, a service they use from a third party. And they ask for the SOC letter. And the letter they got from them didn't even have that company's name on it. Um, and they're trying to use it for that. Uh, and it was old. And so the problem is everybody asked for that, but it really doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that what you're doing is right. The audit isn't any kind of a cybersecurity penetration test. All it is is the auditor goes down the list of questions and you provide information to them. And the information you give to them could be true, it could be false. Um, we'll probably do it at some point, but a, a, good, a, good, a good aspect of this was with FedRAMP. Back, I think, when it first came out, it might have been the 2016, 2017 time frame, and this partner of ours spun up a product with White Cloud as the protecting mechanism for part of the, their product. They couldn't get anybody to buy it because the federal government wasn't holding anybody's feet to the fire. You could still be a federal contractor without being FedRAMP compliant. And so the next year, the federal government says, we're going to hold everybody's feet to the fire, and once again, they said, no, we're not going to do it. Um, so it's like one of those things, you know, if people hold our feet to the fire, we'll do it. 
but but I don't think anybody who's really serious about cybersecurity uh, would say I'm not going to trust you just because you don't have a current SOC 2 compliant um, certificate. That's just that's our opinion. But okay. Uh, okay? Okay. Uh, let's see. So I know it's zero knowledge. Is it zero trust? Yes. In fact, uh, on the back of my business card that I gave to Danny Jenkins a, a couple of years ago, <laughs> we were at a convention together and I met him. And uh, on the back of my business card, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, one here, because I'm sure I've got one. And then I can just read it directly. There's my box of business cards. And what I put on the back of this business card, and it was interesting because their website, I went back through uh, the, uh, whatchamacallit, you know what I'm talking about, the Wayback Machine that has uh, all of that stuff. Hold on one second. I'm looking for one of my business cards. and Hold on. It's in my bag. Give me one second. With the Internet Wayback Machine, we, you, you can see when people have changed their website. And you can see when people have you know, added products, removed products, changed their marketing message. And it was really interesting because uh, that marketing message seemed to change right after this particular conference. On the back of my card it says, what is zero trust app security? Zero trust is equal to verifiable ID plus default deny. Zero trust app security requires that you authenticate apps before they are allowed to run. And then it says, Trust Lockdown, that's our product, is a zero trust architecture that verifies the cybermetric handprint identity of each executable DLL and script that tries to run. It blocks everything else, period. And so we are a zero trust product. Now, in talking about zero trust, I realized the other day, and so we were zero trust before the term was around. Because every time a file tries to run on Windows, we re-authenticate that file's handprint. Another thing we do is in our dashboard. So right now, if I have an admin that I've given access as one of the demo admins, every time he makes a change, we authenticate at that point in time that he still has privileges to make that change. In a lot of cases, you'll have systems where when somebody logs in, it gets those privileges and, it, and it's like stored either in like their session I, in their session or something and now they can go off and do things and you try to disable them, you, you try to kick them out and you can't do that. With our system, we've been zero trust from the very beginning that every admin, every time they try to make any kind of a change or an access for data, it verifies that they have the authentication and privileges to do what they need to do. Does that answer your question? Are you muted? Yes, I was. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Steve? <laughs> I just had to use it. I, That's I good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yes. However, uh, the one word yes response that you started with also answered the question. Okay. Well, <laughs> well the thing is, is I, don't, I don't know that you're going to find that somebody else is zero trust in their dashboard the way we are. And that's, that's what makes us different from other people. And, and okay. this, com this comes from not saying I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I try not to repeat those mistakes. And I think that's the real key is uh, trying to, you know, the experience should, if we remember what we've done wrong or we think about what caused us to fail in the past. That's why bridges in America, for the most part, uh, bridges have gotten much better and don't collapse the way they used to in the 1800s is because engineers learned what bridge failure was all about and fixed it so it's an important engineering principle okay more questions sorry i can be yes. very verbose yes it's okay it's okay um 2fa mfa single yeah. sign-on yes we do yes we do in fact i was just getting ready to log in here let me go show you how our login works because i was logging back in i had logged out of it earlier so i'm just going to basically log in and, on this and i see the uh whitecloudsecurity.com window? Uh, yes, this one right here. You see my cursor? You yes. see the login? Oh, okay. no, so I'm, I'm logging in somewhere else here, and that's my two-factor, right? And mm -hmm. it just changed. But you see how fast our login is. It's very, very quick. This is a different dashboard that I'm on right here. And it had logged out. I had logged out when, when we were fixing some of the uh, 
access problems you and I were dealing with early on, I had reloaded my browser and it logged me out of that window. But yes, we do have two-factor MFA and uh, you can easily turn that off and on. And, uh, and we do not, we do not turn it off for a client just because somebody sa- sends us an email and says, please turn off my MFA. For security reasons, we require uh, the user of the account to contact us with in, in vo- via voice and somebody that we, you know, somebody can recognize their voice because, you know, it's too easy today for people to get tricked. Mm-hmm. I, I've got a really interesting story I heard the other day, but we'll, we'll continue on with focusing on White Cloud. <laughs> um, uh, oh, and uh, what's your password again? Uh, my password is, I don't, I use a, a 17 digit password. Uh-huh. And so I start with one through zero and then I do ABC all the way up to 17 characters, okay? Oh, okay. All right. Please tell me you're kidding. <laughs> well, the longer the password, the more secure it is. Oh. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. So my passwords, as you saw, are very, very, very long. And uh, that one wasn't very, very, very long. Uh, the, that what you saw, what you saw was the two-factor authentication. No, no, no. I mean the little stars up above it. Oh yeah, it was. Well, I think it was just. It's about uh, either 17 or 21 characters long uh, in that particular I, case. I call that like short, low, lower middle class, man. Yeah, like yeah. If you if you wanna if you wanna be up in the one percent, your passwords need to be like 75 characters. Well, that's that's probably true, and we support that. We support as long a password as you want, all the way up to I think it might be 1024. Um, 1024 like, character yeah, password yeah, yeah i think that that's I the max i have for the password let, let me go look let me instead of instead of being a fibber right let me uh let me pop up a panel here um because i can i can see what the uh because i remember i thought i made it really long but you never know Oh, it's because I turned off. Hold on, I gotta go somewhere else. Okay. Too bad we can't edit all this dead time out, right? Um, okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. No, I'm wrong. I lied. The password's length is capped at 200. I used to think, mistakenly think, that uh, the value set in Varcares for your database was was just a display cap, but it actually crunches it down. And uh, but I can easily change that. And uh, and we also use uh, we saw to every particular uh, password differently. So rainbow tables cannot be used. You know, if somebody were to actually get into our database and steal, you know, all the passwords, they would, they would not be able to use a rainbow table to, to create uh, working passwords. And they would also have to get past the, uh, um, the 2FA as well. And, uh, and I'm a big proponent. That's one of the things we tell clients all the time. You always use 2FA. And we see that that's a real big problem that people don't. Don't take that serious. So uh, what do you guys charge for the software to MSPs? Okay. Now, um, this is going to be publicly broadcast, so we don't tell that publicly. But, but I got one of my marketing and sales guys to agree that the MSRP price I could publish. And so, for instance, somebody that gets a fully managed service for us can get it for as little as $10 per endpoint retail per month or $100 per endpoint per year. And so that's the MSPs get a discount. Okay. All right. What kind of discount? Uh, If I told you that, that would tell everybody exactly what they get. One of the reasons we don't publish prices is we, we want the MSPs to make money off of what they, what they do as the, as the middleman. Um, and we don't want customers to squeeze them. Well, I know you're getting it for a dollar, you know, an endpoint, or or I know you're getting it for six dollars an endpoint. And, and then, if a, if a customer is that worried about how much I'm paying for something, I'll be honest, I don't want them as a customer. Well, well, because they're not paying me for 
White Cloud Security, they're paying me for installing a security product and managing the security product and all the additional time that goes into it. So I would not care at all. So let me ask you a question because I want my, I want my sales team to hear what you as, because I know you have a history as a MSP and as an IT guy. And I think you're like me because I was a director of IT for a year and a half. Do you want to contact a sales guy to ask him what the price of a product is? Hell no. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you. So MSPs get a very, very generous discount. Um, so just to kind of give you a clue, we give nonprofits a 25% a discount at the very beginning. So, and the MSPs get better than that. And so it's, it's actually very, very inexpensive. The main reason you're going to talk to us anyway is to try it out with a pilot trial and to use it. Because it, as I was talking about, it's like swimming or riding a bike. You know, sometimes it looks kind of hard at first. But once you do it, you go, wow, that was much easier than, uh, than what I thought it was going to be. You know, something as simple as like, okay, here I've got uh, a Linux system. And I basically just tried to run an unknown script and it got blocked. And uh, basically, I've got this set up for, for all this is doing is just the dashboard. That event was reported immediately, right? And so now, essentially, it shows here. And I turned off my sounds. I want my sounds on. And so, and so we can go here, and we can look at this particular event. And we can see what got blocked. And so it's this file here. And we can see lots of information about the file. We can see. Um, you know, the event ID, we can see the SHA-1. We have the whole handprint. The reason we only show, show the SHA-1 in the dashboard is we don't want a competitor to try to harvest all the data we've collected since 2015, 14, 2014. Um, but if I want to trust this script, I can trust this right now uh, as easily as me saying, I'm just going to trust this script and allow it to run. And I click that, and I come back over here now, and I try to run this script, and there it ran. Okay, that is a big difference between us and the competition. Okay, and now I've got this file here. So that's in my cache over there now. And so I can see here's the file. And, um, and so it's, it's being cached on that endpoint. I have to go manually clear the cache. If I wanted to, I can go do that. Um, but that's how simple I can do this. Now, if I take this file that's been trusted, right? So let me go into my junk directory and make it easier for me to do this. And let's say I change that, that second file, and I'm just going to change it by one little byte here. I'm just going to, actually, I'm just going to change it from junk three to junk four. Okay? And now I try to run it. That's going to get blocked. And what we're going to see over here, that we got this now an alert for that one. And so we go over and click on it, and it's going to open up that dashboard, and we can see that there's the junk four that got blocked. And if I want to trust this one now, I can trust it just as fast. And now when I come back and I run it again, bam, it ran. So you see the difference there in, in how we've designed our architecture is to overcome some of these delays that you have with a traditional application whitelisting system. Yeah, I, I like that. It's so, useful. So this is, the, this is the dashboard. Right. Obviously. Um, when looking at this, it all seems relatively easy. Mm -hmm. So when when checking out uh, Threat Locker, I learned that you really want to let it just sit there and like like audit mode for several days. It, yes. it might be faster now, but like you, you basically want to see everything that the end users are doing on a day to day basis. Now I'm glad you brought that up. And I, and I want to let people know that I'm not paying you money to ask that kind of a question, okay? <laughs> You're not, I'm not even buying you lunch, Steve. That is a very important point and a differentiation, another major differentiation between us and any other application whitelisting systems. Typically, an application whitelisting system does one of two things. You either put it into a audit learn mode for some period of time and where it's watching all the SHAs that come through you know, or the MD5s, you know, and it's collecting them, 
and then you're filtering out what you don't want and at the end you go you transition from audit mode to blocking mode or in the case of the Sophos application whitelisting which originally came from Cortrace uh, what they do is when you install the driver it scans the disk and so every piece of malware and spyware you know an unwanted backdoor like logmein is now part of the trust list and gets uploaded into your system. So if you if you're installing and running LapLocker on a machine that has been compromised, you have to know what files you need to exclude during that process. We we approach it the opposite direction. Uh, when when we started in 2015, we actually would handprint an entire disk, and then we started realizing that's not the right way to do this. We already have a trust list that we've been collecting since 2014, and that trust list allows us to basically say, hey, what are the things that I'm going to trust by default? So this particular group right here is only trusting two profiles. It's trusting the, the White Cloud Security CentOS profile, and it's trusting the admins. And so anything I personally add or another team member adds to that, if I go look at that profile, I can look at this list, and I can go see, well, let me see who are the admins. So there's no admins on this particular list. It does have inheritance. So let's just go, let's go, let's go look at that. Actually, I don't have as a, uh, because this user doesn't have access to that. He could see certain things about it, but he's limited. This is kind of what our system is all about. It's about being able to restrict, you know, what somebody can see, you know. So here you can see, uh, since I'm trusting this profile, I can see what that profile is trusting, and it's trusting several versions of Linux and CentOS that are used as part of the inheritance list for this ZTower subgroup that we're running this demo on. If you basically have an infected piece of, let's say you have a system that has the, the Kaseya ransomware on it right now, you install White Cloud Security on that, reboot the system, you install it and, block, and turn on blocking mode and reboot the system, we will basically block everything that's on there. You don't have to go through any monitor mode in order to allow good apps to run and to block all the bad apps and to block all the unknowns. So that is a major differentiator between us. Um, and, and we actually, that was part of one of the major changes because we realized from the way Cortrace did application whitelisting, that whole process of being in either a audit mode and collecting hashes or, or scanning the disk and collecting hashes. Both of those pick up what's already bad running on your system. And unless you detect it, and you can't detect zero days, you're, you're going to allow it to run. In our case, what we do is we let somebody run in monitor mode. And, and so they can run in monitor mode. So if, they're, if, they're, if it's a new customer that has a system and they say, well, I might have something bad, but I think what I really, I just, it's important for me to keep my business operational. We install in monitor mode, which allows us to see everything. If there was the, if the, if the Kaseya attack tried to happen to them while they're in monitor mode, it would block it. If they turned on alert mode, we would block that known ransomware, even in, even in the monitor or learn mode. And, and then, so, so this is a big difference, and I think that that's one of the things I'd mentioned earlier in the call about how ThreatLocker said, if you're in secure mode, you, you are safe. If you weren't, we're here to help. White Cloud's different. White Cloud, once we applied our global block policy, nobody had to worry. Everybody, whether they were in monitor mode, learn mode, or, or blocking mode, would block that particular malware and block the search that were associated with that malware. All right, so why don't you walk me through what it looks like to um, root, like look at all of the clients, if you will. Oh, like, okay. Is that the subgroup section? Well, so that's, yeah, so that's one of the things here is that in this particular case, um, I've got this is this is like a demo uh, process, sure. and he I can actually do some things like I can look at host usage report. I could open that up and I could show that. I'm not going to show any real clients here uh, for the most part. I've I've connected no, a few I, people in, and, and so and I wouldn't expect you to do that. Right. I was wondering. I I just I don't know. I guess I assumed that you would have some like demo clients. Well, we don't have that. So I do. I, and I've got a bunch of stuff that you can see here that uh, my the connection history that I have. I have some machines. I've got a demo server subgroup that's been running since uh, that's been 
active since 2015. Um, and you can see other various lists of the different groups. And this pivot tables really can be very handy because I can choose how I want to organize this particular thing. I can basically say, well, you know, instead of going by, well, let's do it a different way. Let's pick a different process here. So I'm going to say, hey, let me, let me look at my organization here and uh, my cybersecurity demo organization. I'm going to look at my host status for the organization. And I'm going to look at all the different hosts that are out there. So a lot of these machines are going to be inactive. And notice I've got some filtering turned on, so I'm going to clear the filters. And I can see all the different machines from the different subgroups of the different groups that I have that were active. And I can see when they connected. Get off there. I can see when they connected, you know, when they last checked in. Uh, I can see, uh, I can look at things like blocking mode. And so I've got a lot of different filtering of things that I can do. So let's, let's just go here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to filter out a bunch of old stuff. And so I'm going to go to the last check-in uh, year. Let's start with that. And I'm just going to basically say, well, I really only care about 2020 and 2021. And so I'm just going to apply that. And so now my pivot table is much more manageable. And I can see what's been going on with these different particular groups and endpoints during this period of time. Um, and so it's much easier to, for me to be able to manage this. Um, and so this, this, this gives me a quick overview of what my different endpoints are, are doing and what mode they're in and whether they're in blocking mode. So I can actually, in some cases, uh, in this case, I don't have any machines directly in learn mode right now. Let's see if I can put one of the machines that I have. I might not be able to um, because the machine that's, one, the machine I've got set up for demo is my, my trusty little um, Surface Pro. And it's actually not part of this group. And somebody's trying to call me. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have ways of being able to show the entire group. We've got a, a replacement dashboard that we're coming out with as well. And let me see here. Let's go back here to this. And the difference there is you're going to have basically uh, the, the, a list of being able to see what you're trying to see. You know, hey, show me all the groups I have, and I can see the different subgroups, and I can go uh, look at a particular group, and I can make changes in one of those groups. Uh, so like in Sparks, I can come here. Uh, I can look and see well, what hosts are actually in that group, and I can see there. I can likewise go to Tahoe. I think I might have had something in Tahoe. And I can see those particular machines that are there. And I can drag those around. And so we've been playing with the different uh, way that we're going to make this easier for people to use. But we also have a news feed. And we're, gonna ch we're changing this display to use a little bit different paradigm. It's going to be a, a more natural tree. And we're going to change how this bar is. So we're, we're constantly making updates and improvements to try to respond to what people say is something that they'd rather see and how they want to see it. The, the, the original dashboard was created so that you could use it on mobile. So you can use this on a mobile phone. Uh, and you can use it basically both in, um, in portrait mode on a tablet, or you can basically use it in uh, landscape mode, or you can basically use it in, uh, in any mode you need to. And our newsfeed is a way that you can communicate securely with other team members. You can leave messages about, hey, what's going on here, you know. Um, and basically, that's, that's now tied into this particular group here now. And so the, basically, that's going to show up here on my news feed. And it's going to show up on anybody else's news feed that comes into this particular group. So if I were to go off to one of my other uh, groups that I'm interested in here, let's say, got to click the right button. Let's go back to the Z Tower group. You know, it has its own news feed, and it doesn't have anything in it because there's nothing very interesting there. But if I exit and go back to my main group, I'm going to see what's been posted on this, and so people are basically uh, able to to get a feel for what's actually going on. And it looks like I might have. I love live demos, right? There we go. That might be better. Okay. And we also have the ability to, you have threads in this secure communication, so you can basically post a comment to something, right? And, uh, 
So it's kind of interesting, and you can basically write a comment. You can say whether you like something or not. You can give somebody, you know, the old thumbs down. We say just bully the bad guys. Don't bully anybody else. And uh, so all that information is available, you know, for you to use and to be able to see what's going on. Um, so there it showed up there. It was just another comment. So um, other questions? Yes. So can you – you did already kind of show it working. Do you have any like known bad files? Yeah, yeah. That you can show us. So yeah. So so let me let me do something here. I was earlier. I had downloaded CCleaner uh, on my little tablet on my laptop. So let me let me make sure. Okay. So let me go over here and let me try to run the CCleaner. Oh, I'm trying to run the wrong file. There we go. So CCleaner is trying to run on my laptop right now, and you see right there, Ziggy Desktop. Uh, I got an alert. I got an alert, and now, come on, there it goes. And now it's showing uh, you tried to run CC setup for CCleaner, okay? We can see it's signed by Pureform. If I wanted to, I could trust the Pureform cert. And so I could just, right now, I could go in and say, hey, I'm going to trust this. And by clicking that, everything from Pureform with this cert would be trusted. Or We're not, we're not seeing anything. Oh, what happened to my screen? Oh, now I see it. Okay, all right. So um, right now, can you see this pure form right here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I click that, I can trust this cert. And by clicking that one button, now I'm going to trust everything from that cert. But the other thing, remember, I have software I can trust. And so I can come in and say, hey, you know, there's certain apps that I want to curate. And I can go to pure form. Now, well, let's see here. Maybe pure form isn't on my trust list anymore. <laughs> Maybe they got to be the bad boys. <laughs> mm. There we go. So I could trust Avira, but it's not on Avira cert, it's a pure form cert. So I can actually add that right now uh, as a new cert. But the other thing is, before I do that, we want to investigate because we want to know, you know, where did this file come from, right? So we can go to virus total, and this is going to take us to virus total with one click for this specific instance of CCleaner. And we can see what virus total is saying about this. So the community has six comments on this. We can see that Joe Sandbox has already done analysis. And somebody says, hey, it's a legit. Uh, and so it's, it's a way for me to kind of verify from the community what's going on. So let's go to Joe Sandbox. And let's see what Joe Sandbox says about this version of CCleaner. And uh, I could have I gone over there. It says it's suspicious. So let's click on Joe Sandbox. You know, CCleaner's had you know, their uh, share of problems back in 2017. Um, they got hacked. Yeah. Joe Sandbox is just loading up a whole bunch of data here on my screen. Uh, let's go to Falcon Sandbox. I don't know whether Falcon Sandbox, I've not uploaded it to Falcon. Maybe somebody else already has. Let's see. Ooh. So Falcon Sandbox says that this version of CCleaner, this installer, is malicious. And here are the indicators for it. Let's see what Joe Sandbox says. This is, this is going to be the interesting thing is to compare these two tools. But White Cloud Security makes it easy for you to figure out whether you want to deny access to something. So, this is that classification thing, and, and this is the kind of thing, remember when we were looking at web root earlier, right, uh, the, the Joe Sandbox for web root had some really pretty bad classification schemes that are now removed. And if we go down and we look here at basically the evasion and the discovery. So, CCleaner is trying to discover what other... This is the installer. This is just the installer. It's not trying to run CCleaner. Why would an installer need to know what cybersecurity software is on the system? Mm. Why would an installer for CCleaner need to know whether it's in a sandbox or not? I mean, to me, these are, these are questions that just kind of beg that I'm not going to run this on my system. right? I would not really want to do this. Now, what I could do is I could trust just this one app, and I could just run this. And then anything else it tries to load. So I'm going to do something I normally wouldn't do. Okay, I'm going to try. I'm not going to trust the cert because I don't know what's going. On. I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to trust the app, and I'm going to I'm going to leave some comments here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to. Well, actually, it says that this installer is malicious. I'm really being kind of stupid, but this is a Windows 8.1 um, machine. It probably is time for me to reload it anyway. So let's just see what happens. So I'm going to take this URL, and when I add the trust for this app, uh, I'm going to include that in there so that basically 
it has information about the URL so that later when I look at why I trusted this, I'll know, and I'm going to put in a description. All right, so this is something that's like one of those things that you don't want to do. And the date, I downloaded this today, and today is the 14th. So we'll just put that as the, as the date. And we're going to trust the app. Okay, now I have to go back and I have to run it again. So let me try launching it again. And so it basically, now it's trying to launch. And let's go look at the trust list here for today. And there we can see that it ran. Okay, it already started running. Let's see what else is, is there anything else getting blocked? Well, it's actually popping. Oh, the UAC. UAC came and said, do you want to run it? So now I told UAC, go ahead and run it. What's really confusing to me is mm -hmm. you, like, because you've got things happening on multiple screens, uh -huh. I'm, I'm not sure, like, did you actually try running the application before you hit the trust or allow button? Yes, that's why it popped up on the, that's why it popped up on the, um, on the block list. But the second time? The second time, it, uh, what I did was I then trusted it, and then I, I went over to the other screen and I double clicked it and then it launched it. And then now we can see that it that here in the app history, it's run and we can see it's run with this trust policy that I just added, which is the thing. I'm I not even did. sure I can tell where it's at in the app history. So right here. So the app history, let me let me let me, let me click. Let me. Yeah, let me clear a couple of screens out. And I'm just going to click on this little button right here. This is a shortcut to go see the app history for this particular group. And now it's showing me everything there. And we can see that's the most recent item. We've got some filters here. I can turn some of these filters off. But what we're going to do is this is the most recent thing. So let's see what this, this tried to run. And this was tried to run by some other process. So that's not related to this. It, that was probably the uh, UAC pop-up. So CCleaner is right there. And now CCleaner has popped up and it's asking me to install it. So I'm going to say I'm going to the other screen and I'm clicking now install on this other screen. And now it's like popping up the next thing and it's saying accept or deny. Yeah, I accept that I get it infected when I download this, you know, supposedly malicious version. And now it looks like it's running the installation. And now we're starting to see other things popping up here. So I'm going to click on this. These are all unknowns. So these are all unknowns. And now we're going to open up. I don't see it, though. Do you see my screen and my cursor? I, can you see me? In, can you see here on the left side of the screen me moving my cursor up and down? Now, now I see you. It looks like you clicked on Ziggy Desktops, and then oh, they, now, now it has apps blocked. Oh, uh, yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is I couldn't figure out where you were. Okay. You know, because you you have the curse of knowledge, Ziggy. Sure, you know sure, exactly sure. Where, where to look for right. all of this stuff. And for me, I see a wall of text. Okay, so let's 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 close everything down. Let's go through the process again. Let's just dumb all this down to where we don't have all this stuff on here. We're going to close all these panels. The uh, installer probably failed. Let's see what happens. It's giving me some errors. Let's see if I can start this whole process over again. And All right, so CCleaner's popping up. We're going to get UAC. We've already trusted this one. I'll tell you what. I'm going to go back. I'm going to clear the trust for CCleaner. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to distrust it right there. That was that quick, okay? And then I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to... Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to run CCleaner again, and we'll, we'll go walk very slowly step by step. So that that way your audience can see what's actually going on. And because I think there might be some delays from my screen updating in the, in the streaming. So I'll just make sure that we see every step here. So now I'm trying to run. Come on. Double click it. Okay. All right. Can you see this right here? That, that red one? Yes. Okay. And so that red one tells me hey, I've got a block alert. If it was a monitor mode exception, 
it would basically, and I'm going to shut this off for now. I'm going to change this. So um, basically, if it was a monitor mode exception, it would show up with a yellow one, meaning it's a warning, but it's not as bad. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on this red one, and it's going to take me to the subgroup uh, that has this particular issue, and it's going to open the blocked apps panel for me. Okay. And so right now over here, it opened the blocked apps panel. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear off. These were the other events that took place. I'm just going to clear them off so they're not confusing us. So this is the CCleaner installer right there. And I can see it's got pure form. And, and if I scroll this up here, you can see I've got some buttons on here where I can trust the cert. I can trust the app. I can trust the app and its children. Let's say I'm going to run this. Maybe I want to trust it as an installer. I don't want to do this in this case because I think that there's some malware mixed in here somewhere. And I, I want to see what it's going to try to do afterwards. Uh, I, could, I could trust this as a trusted child, meaning I could say, well, who launched it, right? Well, Explorer launched it. Well, let me just go auto-trust all the children of Explorer. So I'm going to go do that. And I'm going to say, yep, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go click. And it's going to go, uh-oh, Explorer's on the no-fly list. It's not allowed to trust any children, right? So we're not going to allow Explorer to, to launch off a trusted child like this. But in this case, because I want CCleaner, I want the installer to run because I want to see what other junk's underneath, right? And I don't really care about this endpoint. I don't have any valuable data on there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and trust it. And by clicking this button here, it gives me a little app window. Can you see this? Yes. And so I'm going to, earlier what happened was uh, I had found that this, I want the URL from this. I want, the, I want to save that URL here in the URL on when I, when I save this app, I want to be able to come back and say, well, why, why should I trust this or not? And I'm going to actually put it in the description here. And I don't know that's no malware, but added to see other events, other app, let's call them elements during install of C cleaner. And then the version, I'm going to just put in the date here today. I'm going to make it 2020. How about if I do it right? 2021 07 today is the 14th. There we go. And so by clicking this button here now, I'm just going to save this as a trusted app. It doesn't push it anywhere, it just puts it in the database. And so now I can see that I've got this trusted app. Uh, I could have also marked it as, as malware, but now I've trusted it. And so now the next time that my other computer, this little tablet, next time it tries to run this, it's going to check in. And I'm going to go look at my run history here. I'm going to go clear my run history very quickly. I'm just going to archive it. We never delete anything. So I'm going to clear that history. And it's just com confirming that's what I want to do. And this machine has a lot of history. There it is. It's all clear. And so now when we come back later, we're going to have less information on the screen to see what's going on. And so now I'm going to try to run the installer one more time mm -hmm. on this tablet. And there we go. UAC popped up. And now I'm going to say run. And so now it's trying, it's loading the installer, which is some kind of an install shield type app, which what we expect. And it's asking me, do I want to install? And I say, yes, I want to become infected, please. And now it's asking me, yeah, I accept. I click the accept statement, and now it's doing the installation. And so now what's going to happen? Oh, I need to, I, I had set my timer back. I'm going to set it to a higher frequency. And, uh, and so now we see that three events have occurred since three. we last, three, three unknowns. And so I have a couple of different things. If I just click on the, if I just click on this, um, let me go set that up there. If I just click on this three, it's gonna it's gonna open up the window of where those events are. So I might have let's say twenty different subgroups I'm monitoring, and and I get an event for a blocked app on one of them. All I have to do is click on the red link, and it's gonna take me to the subgroup, and it's gonna show me those three events right here. And so there's those three events that got blocked. Now two of them are known by Virus Total. Um, one of them is not known by virus total yet, and now it is known. And so I can go look at these on virus total, and I can see, hey, what's what's going on here? You know, is this something I should be worried about? Should should I trust these? You know, do I want to? 
And this is one of those things where, you know, there are some things from, this is the crowdsource IDS rules. You have to be logged in to uh, virus total and they have free accounts. I encourage every MSP to have a free account because it's a great tool. Their graphing tool is really cool. This is basically um, Google's cybersecurity antivirus graphing tool, which shows the relationships between different modules and stuff like that. So this is very, very interesting, the, the kinds of detail that it gives you. It takes a little while sometimes for it to load all this up and we can see uh, how many of these other apps. The red, the red ones are the ones that have some kind of, so here's one that's had, so this file is related to a file that has had nine antivirus engines flag it as bad already. And so the purpose for this tool is to help us to make decisions about should we trust this or not. Um, but that's how you can see files. Let's go find something that's really bad that happened. Um, or one that, I, ha I have another example here. Let's go to groups I manage and uh, for, for CyberGuy. He's got a, uh, there's a, there's a specific instance where we have a golf instructor had some problems on his machine. And we're going to go back and we're going to look at his blocked apps back, I think it was last month sometime. And so, um, this is something that just got, these are two scripts that just got black blocked the other day, or, or they were blocked back in the middle of June. Uh, but I'm going to go, and I'm going to go look at some of the archived events, because I want to see some more interesting detail. And one of these events was a thing called Annotate. Uh, and what's really cool about this Annotator software is it allows the, the golf instructor to, uh, He's got a lab set up where a guy can go in and take a golf swing, and it basically does this 3D recording of the guy's golf swing, and then he uses the annotator to draw on this video presentation. And he can say, like, here's a line you need to stay in, you know, and this is what you're doing wrong, and then he can use that over and over again. When I saw this golf annotator uh, for this particular client, it's like, something's not right here. Let's just kind of resync on virus total, see if anything's changed there. And so when I click on it, I can see it's not signed. Um, it's, it's basically, I can see who the user is. I'm going to go over here to, let's go to virus total. And so what we found was this software was showing in the crowdsource Sigma rules. Um, the other day it was showing some really, here it is. It's showing in here, it's kind of hard to read, that it's a Chinese rem, uh, uh, remote access Trojan. It has a match for that. It has 265 other high matches that are coming out of these rule sets. And so I contacted, I contacted the, uh, the vendor of the software and I says, hey, let's look at Joe Sandbox on this file. I said, I think there might be something wrong with your software. This was back in June. So Joe Sandbox says, well, it's clean. Remember, you should never say a file is clean because something's not found. It should be unknown or not found. And so we can see here that this particular file, it has some indicators. When we go down into the MITRE attack vector, we can see the virtualization sandbox evasion is going on. We can see obfuscated files going on. Why would an annotation software need to obfuscate anything or do any kind of virtualization uh, evasion? Uh, why would it be doing security software discovery? And so I told them, I says, you know, I just really, this is an unsigned file that, that we got. We looked at the details. It doesn't have a code signing certificate. We verify that it doesn't have a code signing certificate. And they said, oh, yeah, okay. They sent me a new file. Well, first off, they says, yeah, we checked the file on VirusTotal, and it's good. And I said, wait a second. I haven't even sent you the, the I haven't sent you the SHA-256 or the URL or anything. How do you know what file you're checking? And they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so they sent me a link to download a new file. And I downloaded a new file, and I actually ran that file on a different white cloud system that's inside the subgroup. So let's go, let us go do this a little differently. Let's go here for groups I manage. Let's look for, um, let's look at all apps that he manages. And we're going to search for annotator. I don't even have to, it uses regular expressions. And so I'm going to go all the way back into the June timeframe. 
and we can see that there's two different versions of this file. One that ran on the golf instructors and the other one ran on, on, on one of my test systems. And so now that one's got a two hit count. I go to virus total on this and when I look this up on virus total, it was like, hey guys, guess what? The one you just gave me, it has some issues as well. It's got even more. <laughs> it had even more criticals than the original one. I said, come on guys, and this file is still unsigned. This is kind of like what I was doing with WebRoot saying, come on guys, you got to do tell me something here. This is an unsigned file. And so then they gave me a signed version of the file. Oh, here's a link to another one. It was like, okay. And that one was signed and I, I ran a scan on it. It was good. So I don't know about this vendor, you know, whether I trust them or not, but I now know that these files are bad. And if I said, hey, uh, I want to block this for everybody, I can do that very quickly by saying, I'm going to add, and I'm going to say, I can say it's distrusted. I don't know what it is, but I think it might be bad. I could say, I'm going to add a deny policy. These will all show up with different icons on our dashboard. So I'm going to say, I know that what it is, but I just want to block it. Or I can say, hey, I want this to show up as malware, right? And so then the policy will be marked as malware in that group. And then now when I'm in this, uh, when I go back to the Sparks group, let me go back to my Sparks group here. Got to click the right button, Z. Okay. Um, It was easier when I had it up there on the screen. Give me one second. Um, so I, I have to pick on you right now. You um, do. It's it's a valid complaint. I have no problem with that. So, well, do you even know what I'm going to say? Yeah, you're going to say it's really hard to find this. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard that the CEO of the company can't even find yeah, things. It, it is. Well, actually, what I'm trying to do is not there's an easy shortcut, but the shortcut has a lot of other information that I was trying to hide. I didn't mm. want I didn't want you guys to see all the other groups that I have, you know, which are some real people. But over here, for instance, you've got annotator, and so now notice that I've added that, and I added it today. But the that's why we're doing the other dashboard is to get away from this and to make it easier to find. And we're actually adding a search uh, field here that you'll be able to search by a host name, by the host nickname, the subgroup. A URL, a name, and find all kinds of things directly from one search field, which will, because a lot of times you're in a hurry to get somewhere and you don't want to have to do three or four clicks to get somewhere. But essentially, what I was able to do was I was able to add this as a policy, you know, for uh, that's going to block here in this particular Sparks group. And I could have, when I did the, when I added the trust for this, I could have also added it to any other group. In fact, right now I can copy this policy and I can say, you know what? This something is something that I really need to mark as malware for everybody. And I'm going to go to the very top of the inheritance tree, and I'm going to mark it as malware for every one of my users. And so now by doing that, I've now marked this. And now when I go as Cyber Guy, and I say, let's, let's go back to the very top of my list, I can see here now, that there's now this new annotator that I just added at the very top of my inheritance tree. And every endpoint in the inheritance tree is going to block this particular file. And so that's what's really useful about our inheritance structure is it makes it really easy. You can trust something at one point. You can trust an admin at a point in the inheritance tree. And it flows all the way down until you get to the point where you distrust something in the inheritance tree. Um, and, and once again, this is, it's a new concept. It's not something that people are used to thinking about or trusting. And so that's, that's part of, I think, why it can be a little difficult for people at first, but it is a lot like swimming. Swimming looks really scary until you figure out that, you know what? I can get in the pool and I can stand up. I can wade in. So white mm -hmm. cloud security makes it easy for you to wade in the pool. You have to install it first. You have to put that wading pool in your backyard before you can actually try it. And so I, I, I encourage people to try a pilot of white cloud security. And our team members will walk you through it, help you to, to do things. We give as much free training as you need, uh, unless you're a government entity that pays for training. <laughs> that qualifier was there for one of my sales guys. I like it. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and turn our cameras back on. Okay. And if you could disable your share. I can if I can find it. There it is. 
And now let me see <laughs> if I can find this. Let me, there we go. And now I found where I'm at. Let me see if I can turn myself back on. There we go. Thank you so much for your time today, uh, Steve, and for all of your MSPs who've joined us. Absolutely. I, I've learned a lot about how not only your tool runs, but how other tools run. And that's not to say anything negative about them, right. but I mean, it's, it's just neat to understand how, you know, how stuff works. Transparency is really important in cybersecurity. We should mm -hmm. understand what a tool does and what it doesn't do. So we are, when we, when we do technical deep dives with people, we explain exactly what happens because if you understand it and understand how simple our mechanism is inside the cloud, then you go, okay, I get that. And that's why it can protect a Docker container or it can protect a, uh, a Linux system or protect a Windows system, okay? And how it does it. And then you have a sense of understanding rather than being, a, you know, there's been a lot of machine learning and AI systems that are black boxes that have 500 indicators and we have no idea how those things get weighted together. And I, I took artificial intelligence classes in college and some of that stuff can be very nebulous. You know, just saying that something has artificial intelligence doesn't mean that it actually works. So uh, I prefer simple very, explanations. Very good. Uh, Dave Highsmith says, it is not as clunky as it appears in this demo. It is fairly easy to learn. And uh, someone else, Yates Networks, the UI does need work. It's all good, though. Thank you for owning it. Yes. So. And, and that's the thing is, is that when something happens, we will, te we will tell you, right, oh, this is what happened, or this is a mistake, or this is a mm -hmm. bug or something that happens. We're, we're not going to hide and cover things up because you need to understand what's going on. You need to know what's taking place. And I think if you talk to, the, to our, our MSPs, they will t I've had them tell me time and time again how great our support is. Uh, I was a, a national service manager for a small process control company back in the 70s and 80s. And for me, how you treat customers and how you take care of them is what really makes a business run. We don't spend money on marketing. We don't spend like all these ad campaigns because I would rather grow organically through word of mouth because people will tell other people when, when you work. And I don't, I don't believe in, in trying to turn us our, our product into a fad. That's not what I want. I want people who have a problem to try it and say, oh, it works for me, or to give me negative feedback and say, oh, that didn't work, or that's not what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Well, very good. Um, Ziggy, can you stick around for just a couple sure, minutes after, sure. after we get signed off and everything? I want to chat more. Sure, um, thank you. Seriously, guys, thanks so much for sticking out and watching this one. Um, I hope you guys learned something about not, not just white cloud security, but about whitelisting and the importance of doing it. Um, because we're, we're at a, a place where this is, this is not a want, it's a need. Yeah. So thank you, Ziggy, for coming on and doing this. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, we're going to get going. Thank you again. And I look forward to doing more um, calls with you guys in order to talk about other kinds of issues. Awesome. Thanks, Ziggy. Thank you. Bye.